The first scenario in Resident Evil Outbreak is a great introduction to the Outbreak games for many reasons. And today we'll be taking a look at each and every perk that comes from this scenario alone, as it is filled with character arcs, side missions, secrets, exclusive weapons and items, but most importantly, it demonstrates the beginning of the Outbreak and how the citizens of Raccoon City dealt with such a dreadful nightmare. But before exploring through everything that makes this scenario a great introduction, first we must understand why Raccoon City was a perfect location to take place at for this spin-off game. Because after all, this game came out in 2003, and at this point, we had already seen the destruction of Raccoon City, and the virus had been problematic in separate locations afterwards. So why Raccoon City? Why go back when we already know the fate of this location? One of the main reasons why the Outbreak series is beloved by fans of the original series is because of its main characters. Instead of having Chris, Leon, or Jill as the main protagonists, we got to play as citizens of Raccoon City, characters that lived a regular life doing regular jobs when they're suddenly met with a deadly virus destroying their homes and witnessing countless victims taken with no ideas as to what on earth was happening. Experiencing what they had to go through was a fantastic idea for a new spin-off game of the series. And since the developers of Resident Evil 2 and 3 did such a remarkable job with the presentation of this city, and how certain areas appeared during the outbreak while playing as Leon, Claire, Jill, and Carlos, we certainly wanted to see more locations of Raccoon City. The way the streets and buildings were designed, the architectural work was very... old school giving off a perfect atmosphere to make players invested in exploring more routes in this doomed city. It is why Raccoon City has always been seen as one of the most iconic locations in gaming history. So, even when we know that this city will soon be destroyed, it doesn't change the fact that it's still worth exploring. If anything, its untimely demise further urges the players to explore everything before it inevitably gets wiped off the face of the earth. And as for the characters you play as, this was their home. Seeing the town you grew up in, suddenly being attacked by a deadly virus that turns people into carnivorous zombies, including even more bizarre surprises like the likes of giant insects, infected animals, and additional dangerous creatures. All this instantly leading to Raccoon City being eradicated. It would leave more of an impact to those living in it. But even though Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, Rebecca Chambers, and Barry Burton were also living in Raccoon City, only Jill was around to experience her hometown being destroyed. After what happened at the Spencer Mansion in the Arkley Mountains, the others left town to either move on in life, or continue their fight to take down Umbrella, which was in a different country. And since a lot of us were left wondering what happened all over Raccoon City as the main characters were dealing with William Burke and Brian Irons, Nikolai, and the Nemesis, this game gave us exactly what we wanted. Kevin Ryman, a police officer of the RPD and a marksman with his special 45 auto. Cindy Lennox, a waitress at Jay's bar and a healer of the group. Mark Wilkins, a security guard working for a security company in Raccoon City and the strongest of the group. George Hamilton, a doctor working at the city hospital and capable of creating a variety of compound chemicals for antidotes, hemostat pills, and various recovery medicines. Yoko Suzuki, a university student, as she calls herself. Jim Chapman, a subway employee whose intuition makes him very good at solving puzzles. David King, a quiet but remarkable asset. His occupation is being a plumber, but he is capable of combining many items together to create homemade weapons. And Alyssa Ashcroft, a newspaper journalist working for the local paper. She carries a lockpicking tool that can be very useful for both finding weapons and progressing through areas. These ordinary citizens of Raccoon City must rise and fight their way through the disasters that strike along their way to salvation. They must use their strengths and abilities to progress through each area. This scenario immediately gets you well acquainted with each character, their personalities and abilities. However, it is required that anyone playing this game takes a look at the game's manual or strategy guide to understand the personal items for certain characters 
and the game won't tell you how to use these personal items to your advantage. Even when selecting a character before jumping into the game, you'll only get a short summary of each character's strengths. I'll be describing each and every character's strengths and weaknesses in a separate video since most perks aren't required to complete this scenario. It is possible to complete a scenario without using any of the perks, but let's just move on to the main objectives that need to be dealt with in order to complete the first scenario. The first thing you must do as one of the survivors is find the staff room key. Since the entrance to the bar is what's bringing the zombies in, you could barricade the entrance with these two large barrels, or find the key and head upstairs. Barricading the entrance will barely slow them down, and there's also a random chance of a barrel getting stuck halfway and immobile, except on easy mode. So it's recommended to skip that and get the staff room key on the bar counter. Now if you're playing this scenario in the hard or very hard difficulties, Will, the bartender, will have the keys with him and you'll need to either wait for the zombies to break through the door and attack him, or break the door open with force by either tackling it, using a melee weapon, or shooting it enough times. Now after getting the door open, you must head upstairs, now find the key with the blue tag to unlock the only locked door in that floor. There are four rooms in this area to explore, and if you're playing in the harder difficulties, you'll need to explore the owner's room to find the key with the blue tag. For the easy and normal difficulties, the key is surprisingly hidden underneath the newspaper, which can be used to turn an alcoholic drink into a Molotov cocktail, so even if you aren't planning on making that weapon, you should still pick up that item and then switch it with the key underneath. Once obtained, unlock the door and head upstairs into the liquor room. There's a wine room right next to the entrance which has keys to a forklift up ahead, where you will need to use it in order to lift a set of boxes to climb up a ladder and crawl across the shelf tops to a vent opening. If you're playing one of the harder difficulties, the keys won't be there, and you must instead pick up an alcohol bottle and go back to the owner's room, where you will set the bottle in a wall with all the portraits to unlock the drawer of the nearby desk, which will have the keys to the forklift. Once you've gone through the vent opening in the liquor room, head upstairs where you will now be on the rooftop of the building. Here, you must head to the other side of the pathway where there will be a fence blocking a walkway. Knock it down by force, and a cutscene will occur, showing an officer on the street below announcing that the city block will be closed off in three minutes. So now, you and the rest of the survivors must climb onto the walkway and run to the eastern edge. Each survivor will have to jump across a gap and reach an apartment building rooftop. As your character runs forward, you must press the action button just as your character reaches the ledge to jump the gap correctly. If done right, you'll immediately reach the other side. If done incorrectly, you'll either have to try again, or your character will dangle on the edge, and you'll have to rapidly tap the action button until your character finally starts pulling themselves up. A partner can also help you, so be sure to call out for help. Depending on the character you chose to play as, the game will give you specific teammates. Here are the necessary commands to get your partner to come and help you, or just tap the right joystick to the left to cry out for help from anyone nearby. After reaching the apartment building rooftop, Take the elevator down to the first floor and run towards the door at the south end of the building. This is when you finally reach the city streets, and now... You startled me. I'm surprised you're still alive. The whole city's a war zone. We need all the help we can get. Now! Move the police car over there to build a barricade. Go! After meeting Officer Raymond, you can help him by pushing the two patrol vehicles forward to form barricades on the street, which is the fastest way to progress. Or you could fight off every enemy until a couple of minutes go by, and Officer Raymond will then flee to the next area, where you must again hold off any oncoming enemies as he tries to break open the entrance up ahead. You can also attack the door beside him to break it open faster, but after doing so, Raymond gets attacked after realizing something. Hey, listen, you should go now. Huh? Ah! That's a fuel tank. Leak the gas and use it to burn these bastards. Do it now! Ah! This part is quite easy. Pick up the lighter next to Raymond's body. You can take a shotgun as well, but then run to the fuel truck up ahead. Open the valve on the back of the truck to spill enough fuel on the pavement floor. 
Then use a lighter to ignite it and incinerate all zombies in that area. All survivors must then jump into the water below, otherwise a fuel truck will explode taking down all players nearby. You must then climb through a small hole leading into a tunnel. Here you will find a recovery item or more depending on the difficulty mode you chose. At the west end of the tunnel is a ladder leading back to the streets, but this time in front of the Apple Inn Hotel. Here you don't have to worry about any zombies or enemies. There are two other survivors waiting up ahead with a police officer known as Officer Dorian, who happens to be waiting for other survivors who made it this far. Anyone here gets to hitch a ride out of this area. After speaking to him, a cutscene will occur to get this process going, and eventually they meet a dead end. That's it then? Get in please. Highway is too dangerous. We're taking side streets. Damn! Another barricade. As you can see, there are too many roadblocks. I'm afraid you'll have to get out and continue on foot. Here is where you get to load up with the supplies in the van before heading off into battle. That's right. Just like with the classic titles, this is a sign that you're about to go into a boss fight. Only here, it's not actually a boss fight, but instead, something just as dangerous. Oh no. No. The city's gone. No. No, it can't be. So many. What's taking so long? Hurry up! I'm trying! I'm almost done! Uh, hurry! Hurry! This way! Okay, it's done! Eric! What should I do? Here's where you have two options. You can either continue up ahead and assist the officers in detonating the explosive charges set up all over the street, or backtrack to the police van and tell Officer Dorian you're ready to leave. I'm guessing the survivor also explains a critical situation up ahead, and this ends the scenario. Both endings give you points, and they will both add to the event checklist as well. However, detonating the explosives will give you more points and a better ending for your character. To set off the explosives, all you need to do is pick up the detonator main unit on the far left east side of the street, then run across to the far right side of the street where the detonator handle lies next to a fallen officer. Combine both items, then stand near the rig kit in the center of the street, and use the detonator to finish off the scenario with a blast. I always preferred fighting the hordes of zombies over backtracking and ending the scenario, especially since you just got extra weapons and supplies for some action. You could even find a magnum revolver along the way, although it won't be available in the very hard difficulty. Now, after everything you just witnessed as to what is needed to complete this scenario, there are still plenty of side quests you can also complete to extend your playthrough and experience of this scenario. For starters, remember Bob? Bob may be infected, but you could help him and bring him along with you all the way to the rooftop of the bar. Like with every side mission, you don't have to do these. They're just there to give the player a different experience for every time they play this scenario. If you play as Mark and assist Bob through this scenario, it will trigger additional short cutscenes. Then, once you reach the upstairs area with Bob and use the stapler gun to nail the planks across the doorway between sections, you'll get another short cutscene. Unfortunately for Bob, he still doesn't make it, and once you reach the rooftop with him, 
You will get a cutscene where this happens. I can't move anymore. I know me, and I'm not gonna be someone else's burden. Bob, stop! No, you don't understand, Mark. I'm no different from them. I feel the hunger. So, so, please, let me die while my conscience remains. Oh, oh Bob. Bob! Even though Bob does not survive whether you help him or not, you do get rewarded more points for your troubles. Points are used to buy bonus features such as costumes, artwork, and a lot more. There's over 170 bonus features in the collection menu and each item can be quite costly. So you'll have plenty of replay value for this game. But first, you must unlock the specific item in order to purchase it. And most items can only be unlocked by finding special items throughout each scenario. These special items cannot be seen, and they can only appear in a specific set. There are four sets. Each scenario contains 20 special items and close to 20 character specific special items. And not all of these special items will appear during a playthrough. So they appear in sets and they are determined by random chance at the start of a scenario. But what is for sure is that sets 0 and 1 will only be available in the easy and normal difficulty levels. Sets 2 and 3 will only appear in the hard and very hard difficulties. It's a bit tricky when it comes to finding specific special items especially since you cannot see them, but they are worth searching for as they can unlock extra content and some items can even reveal secrets, sometimes secrets that can relate to main characters of the Resident Evil series. The first outbreak scenario has many secrets to behold. Assisting Bob leads to extra short cutscenes. Bob, stop! No, you don't understand, Mark. I'm no different from them. I feel the hunger. <laughs> there are scissor worm creatures that appear only when you're playing in the hard and very hard difficulties. Collecting items aside from special items can also get you extra points, and a lot of players of this game may never have noticed a specific enemy type of the game. This zombie type is called the Permanent Enemy. It is a zombie wearing a flannel shirt who comes to life as you reach the top of the stairs on the second floor. Even if you attack the zombie, knock it down, and continue beating it until it stops twitching, it'll never disappear, and it will reanimate several times and continue attacking you. This Permanent Enemy appears in many scenarios as well, so try to avoid it as much as possible. But the best secret in this scenario has got to be reading the wall scribblings. This is secretly a side mission that has you further exploring the environment, but the writing can only be seen if you have a lighter. You'll get a description that hints to the second secret note location. There are five secret notes which must be read in the exact order as described, and by the time you find the fifth secret note, you'll be rewarded with a spear. The spear can be a homemade weapon by combining a long pole with a chopper kitchen knife but only David can create a spear since it requires vinyl tape as well. So finding this spear is very helpful, especially when you're playing on the harder difficulties as you'd soon be facing off against the horde of infected giant scissor worms. The spear causes a lot of damage and can easily knock down a zombie even in the harder difficulties. And remember, zombies in the hardest difficulties will not go down immediately. They'll take up to an entire handgun clip just to knock one down so the spear is very useful to knock them down with one hit. After countless playthroughs of this scenario alone, I should have been bored after the 10th playthrough, but because of all the extra options and items you can use or collect, each playthrough has felt vastly different, making the experience a satisfying playthrough every time. Even when it comes to speedrunning the scenario for an S rank, it never became boring, because the challenge was always there. You can double your points by beating the scenario without taking any damage, and even more points if you beat the scenario without using a weapon. 
It is very difficult, even when you're trying to speedrun on normal difficulty, but it's still entertaining nonetheless. I mean, even the easy difficulty mode was worth trying simply because it is the only time you'll ever find Magnum Revolver rounds. <laughs> so as you can see, there are many reasons why the first scenario was a great introduction to the Outbreak games. We finally got to experience what the Outbreak was like from the beginning, and if anyone was wondering how it even started, well, the opening sequence sure answers that question. Although, if you haven't played any of the previous Resident Evil games, you might be confused as to who this is, and why is it attacking these men. But for those of us who played Resident Evil 2, this was an amazing cinematic intro, as it almost feels like you're watching a movie. And it showed us that the chaos had occurred just below the city streets, where the survivors await for an unwelcoming and frightful surprise. That's it for the video. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button to give this video a chance to grow. I'd like to thank all my Patreon supporters for their impeccable generosity. Your support means a lot to me and you are part of the reason why I try to make the best content that I can. And if you like this content, check out the rest of my channel. You'll find more entertainment from separate franchises I like to cover such as Mortal Kombat, Dragon Ball Z, Celebrity Deathmatch, Men in Black, The Mask, Batman Comics, The Terminator, TMNT, Dino Crisis, Resident Evil, and more. If you're a Patreon supporter, check out my exclusive videos such as the Gantz content. And if you'd like to show your support, go to my Patreon and support the channel, which is only a dollar. Sacrifice that McChicken for extra quality content, my friend. But anyways, I'll see you on the next video, and remember to have an awesome day.